how do you feel about these nice, comfy lessons today? Are you happy with all of these? Comfortable in how you're worshiping God and giving God glory? And if you are, wonderful. I, I give you praise because personally, I've squirmed a lot this week reading these lessons. And it's particularly hard considering how we've been looking at building the beloved community for the summer. Beloved community can mean a lot of things. It can mean this nice little place we carved out for ourselves in Agora Hills at New Hope, the I love my church kind of community. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as we work it out just a little differently. Maybe like, I love this part of God's church that God has entrusted us to share. What are the other ways we can think about beloved community? There's the community made of the beloved, which would be all of us, not just the church members at New Hope, but the whole gathering of God's people. Each one of us has been created by God as God's beloved child. God may not be thrilled with everything each of us does, but in our creation, we are beloved children who make up that beloved community. I, I understand the the Adult Sunday School, The Wired Word, was talking about uh, the moonwalk today a little bit. And I had really planned to work a lot more of that into my sermon and then found I ran out of most of time. But I went back and asked my brother, so do you remember where you were 50 years ago and a week when, when that first moonwalk happened? Because we, my family always went to, on vacation to the same place every year in Kentucky. And in 1969, they had this big gathering room with a big TV. I mean, it must have been, oh, gee, as wide as this pulpit. Because in 69, man, that was big. But I can remember as many people as the room would hold, being that community together as we watched just in awe what was going on. It's another way to be community, to be connected by an event, by something that happens. Some of the ideas of community are a little harder to deal with than others. I mean, I'm perfectly fine with my friends and family being beloved children of God. I'm even okay with most of the people I meet every day being beloved children of God, even the one who cut me off on the freeway and spout unpleasant thoughts I don't agree with on Twitter. But God seems to be saying that we are all the beloved community, even my worst enemies, even the people who make what I feel are terrible choices. I, I heard you all laughing during the Genesis reading because Abraham gets this a lot better than I do. He starts bargaining with God. 50, 40, 30, suggesting that even Sodom and Gomorrah must have some upright people in them. And should those people die because of the less upright? He goes all the way down to 10 and asks God, will God destroy a place that had been called the Garden of Hashem, the Garden of the Lord, earlier on in Genesis? And he gets it down to 10, and God agrees. Well, no, if there are 10 righteous people found there, I will not destroy it. Well, unfortunately, we know how the story ends, so we have to assume that not even 10 righteous people were to be found in those cities. Do you know what the sin of Sodom was that God got so scandalized over? You probably think you do. The first thing that likely comes to your mind, though, is not what God says through the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 16. This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. The city of Sodom was keeping beloved community into a very tight circle those who already had money and food and were proud to say so, those who really had no interest in providing for the poor or welcoming the stranger or being stewards of God's good creation. 
it wasn't just the most blatant of their sins, the ones that are told in the passage right after this in Genesis, that made God so scandalized that fire and brimstone rained down on the cities, making a wasteland out of what was a fertile garden. Jewish scholars, even before the time of Jesus, started expanding on what the prophets, like Ezekiel, said about how we are called to care for each other and for God's good creation. For them, the beloved community doesn't just mean people or the people of God who believe in a certain way, but the entire creation. We're called to love all that God has created and to care for the people, the animals, the plants, everything in a way that shows we recognize that God is sovereign and we plan to love God's creation the way we are called to take care of it. That puts a whole new spin on what community is all about. And the intentions that we've been working on this summer, if you've gotten into them, have done much the same thing. They're asking us to spend the day with curiosity and imagination, to spend the day with God and to share what we're learning and to share joy They've asked us to look at things as diverse as plastic and insects, as waiting and water. I don't know how you're doing with them, but I've done better some days than others. Thinking about these things, though, and paying attention to them have made me pay more attention to how much time I really spend living into community the way God calls us to really living into creation. We are deeply connected to each other, to the earth, and to God even when we may not want to be. It's a lot easier to wall ourselves off like Sodom, but obviously that isn't at all what God is calling us to do. Jesus' disciples recognize what God is asking of them, even when they may not express it very well. I like the little bit of competition that co creeps into the gospel of the very first today. Did you hear that? Hey, Jesus, John taught his disciples to pray. Are you going to teach us to do that once you come back from praying by yourself, huh? It doesn't say which one of Jesus' disciples asked the question. We probably all have our, dis our ideas about that. And maybe we've asked God that ourselves. Jesus, teach us how to pray. For once, there's something that the disciples request out of Jesus that I can just imagine him getting a really big smile on his face. Finally, they're asking me something that I can really do and I want to do instead of, hey, put me on your right hand or put me on your left hand or any of this, but something I want them to be hungry for. All right. So he starts laying out the bones of prayer. Father in heaven, may your name be holy. Well, that sounds like prayer the disciples are used to. It's the start of almost every Jewish prayer, then and now. Baruch atah Adonai Elanehu Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. Nothing's changed about this beginning to prayer. It's what the disciples would have learned as devout Jews what their fathers and mothers would have taught them at a very early age, and what they would have heard in the temple in Jerusalem or a synagogue in a small town like Nazareth or Bethlehem or Capernaum. It's probably the phrase that Jesus used when on that last night of his life, after supper, he took bread, said a blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to everyone to eat. It's what I learned 16 years ago and more from a beloved Jewish friend who taught me the beginning of the prayer she used when she lit Shabbat candles. She, of course, could say it without thinking with the right musical Hebrew intonations. Not so much I, I still stumble over a little, but it still echoes in my head. Enough so that when I don't have the concentration for any other blessing, I try to say that one into myself and to God. After this traditional start to prayer, though, this is where Jesus starts changing things up. Traditional Jewish prayer would have gone on with a phrase about why we're praising 
worshiping, and blessing God. The prayer over bread or food starts with that blessing and finishes with God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Well, Jesus doesn't go right there. Instead, he had a radical declaration. Let God's kingdom come right here, right now. As Pastor Craig, among others, has phrased it, let down here be like up there. Talk about a beloved community. This is the party. Let God's reign start right up. Then Jesus gets around to the bread part. He asks for exactly what God provides for the Israelites in the wilderness. Give us each day our daily bread. Give us enough for today. What else do you notice about what Jesus says when he teaches his disciples and us to pray? He's telling them all the things that he's already in the process of doing. Jesus comes to feed us, to save us, to redeem us, protect us. He can't protect us from everything, but he does take on that time of trial for us. And he does it not because we deserve it, but because God calls us beloved. In today's gospel, Jesus even says, he knows that we're evil, you who are evil. Know how to give good gifts to your children. Wow. The amazing part is that admission, made in such a matter-of-fact way, doesn't stop Jesus from giving us far better gifts than bread or eggs when we deserve snakes and scorpions. All the lessons have one thing in common today. We're better together, and God calls us to be together in communion with God and each other and God's creation, deeply connected. When we start separating ourselves from other people, from the earth, from God, that's when we get in trouble. So we need to stay connected with each other, with God, with light. Please join me in prayer. God, creator of the universe, thank you for all that you have given us. Help us to be aware of all these gifts. And as Jesus promised, send us your Holy Spirit to equip us to share them, to be your beloved community for this world. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.